Well, welcome everybody. And we're uh, very happy to have um, Aya Santatita with us here uh, tonight because uh, I've actually never met uh, Venable Santatita, but I've heard a lot of good things about her and she is going to uh, come and visit our monastery hopefully in the autumn, but it of, of course all depends on uh, the corona uh, situation and whether the borders can open. Um, so tonight she's here to give a talk for us for about uh, sharing the poems from the first three women, the poems of early Buddhist nuns. Uh, uh, a few weeks ago, Aya Ananda Bodhi uh, took a few poems from that. So uh, Aya Santatita will take several other poems from that and expound on the wisdom of impermanence. And the first that um, she selected uh, as a, um, yeah, to, to, to introduce this is from the Dhammapada number 113. Better it is to, to live one day seeing the rise and fall of things than to live a hundred years without ever seeing the rise and fall of things. So that's a very beautiful verse from the Dhammapada. The Venerable Santa Chitta Bikuni was born in Austria and did her graduate studies in cultural anthropology focusing on dance, theater, and ritual. She also worked in avant-garde dance, theater, as a performer and costume designer. In 1988, she met um, Ajahn Buddhadasa in southern Thailand, who sparked her interest in Buddhist monastic life. So she has trained as a nun in both the East and the West since 1993, primarily in the lineage of Ajahn Chah, and has practiced meditation for over 30 years. Since 2002, she has also received teachings in the lineage of Dilgo Ken... Uh, forgive me if I say this wrong, but uh, Dilgo Ken Serin Posh. Yes, thank you. Uh, Santa Chita Bikuni uh, co-founded Aloka Vihara Forest Monastery <coughs> together with uh, Aya Ananda Bodhi in 2009 and received the Bikuni ordination in 2011. Since moving to the US, she has also greatly benefited from Biko Analio's teachings on early Buddhism and from the guidance of Kenmo Konchok Nima Droma. She is particularly interested in creating sanctuary close to nature, living in community and bringing wisdom traditions to the environmental movement. Let me go back here. So we will have a, a guided meditation, uh, first of all, and then Dhamma talk, and afterwards you can ask questions. And so, Venable, I uh, give the uh, microphone to you, so to speak, and I will uh, mute myself. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, you know, for inviting me and introducing me. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to start with a guided meditation to just get us all settled. And uh, the guided meditation will also, you know, be um, on impermanence, like all meditations are on impermanence, actually. But we, I'm going to emphasize that. And uh, I always like to start to say at the beginning of, of a teaching or of a meditation that, you know, meditation isn't about um having a different experience than what we are having just right now but meditation is much more about being with our experience as it is because it's going to change anyway and also you know there's two ways how we can speak about meditation either in the sense of you know needing to achieve something in the future which we don't already have or we can look at it that it's all about letting go of excess baggage, really. All of that, you know, which we tend to project onto present moment experience, you know, which is called ignorance, really, and which keeps us, you know, keeps us caught in different habitual patterns of relating and then kind of repeating the same things over and over again. And then through really, you know, preparing the mind that it is sensitive enough to be able to really pay attention to impermanence 
is one way, you know, how we can make an inroad into this tangle of ignorance and just slowly but surely drop some of it. And I just like to start with the meditation by, you know, finding a, a posture you can sustain for about 40 minutes or so. And then, you know, just uh, bringing the body and the mind together by just becoming aware of the body sitting and breathing in and breathing out. And just recalling for a moment, you know, why you are doing this, why do you meditate? Why did you come on today for this Zoom session? And if you, you know, can't really make up your mind, maybe remember the first time, you know, when you had that inkling that this is something, you know, which has value. Maybe you met someone, or you read something, or you heard something, and then you had that kind of, you know, feeling of uplift in the heart, leaping up, you know, having that sense of possibility of a greater freedom. So, you know, I want to uh, guide us in a meditation on the four foundations of mindfulness which is the template, you know, for all other teachings in Buddhist meditation. Meditation of, you know, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feeling tones, mind states and principles or laws of nature. So we can just start with the first foundation, body, by just becoming aware of earth element in our experience. And you know, in order to connect with it, we can just either, you know, tap your teeth together and have a direct experience of hardness. And then just studying it on the top of the head, just becoming aware of hardness, structure, stability of earth element, which you can sense in the bones of the skull and the teeth, which are called the tips of the bones. And then just sweeping down over the neck, or the shoulder bones. The bones in the upper arms, lower arms and hands, many little bones. Then the spine and the rib cage, the torso. The hip bones. Thigh bones. Lower legs and feet. Earth element. And then, you know, becoming aware of the sense of uh, pressure on the cushion on the chair, you know, connecting with external earth element. And the sense of gravity, which keeps us drawn towards the planet. The vast earth element. There's a sense of equanimity and peace in that.
and earth element internally and earth element externally is exactly the same. There's a constant exchange happening through eating, going to the bathroom, and also all the other elements, water element, fire element, air element. Constant interchange happening. constant process. And this part of the meditation is about, you know, familiarizing ourselves with that very simple truth And, and relaxing into that. Earth element sitting on earth element. And then if the mind wanders off into thinking about something, that's just the way it is. That's how the mind works. The mind is thinking. It's in Buddhism, we consider the mind as being one of the six senses and it thinks. Just like the nose is you know, smelling odors and the ear is hearing sounds, the mind thinks. It's not about not thinking, but it's much more about not attaching to the thoughts or the smells or the sounds for that matter. So when the mind wanders off for a short moment, just you know, gently bringing it back. But if, the, you know, if we get hijacked into some kind of a story, then it's important to, you know, to look again and see what was the feeling tone? Why did I get caught up in this? Because it surely has something to do with the feeling tone. And seeing if we can identify it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. The second foundation of mindfulness, Vedana, feeling tone, which is very, very powerful and very unconscious most often. So to discern this underlying current, and often, you know, pleasant feeling down is connected with greed. Unpleasant feeling down with ill will or aversion. And neither pleasant nor unpleasant with just ambling around or illusion. And just as soon as we can identify the feeling down, we step out of the story, at least for a moment or two.
And you know, this kind of training ourselves in recognizing the underlying feeling tone is also very helpful for you know daily life situations. It's just check, you know, what's what's happening, what's motivating me under the surface. And if you get really lost a lot in a big story, just come back and start again with earth element, just scanning down the body. And grounding ourselves. But if the mind is you not know, willing to just stay in the present moment, just uh, rejoicing in that, in a sense of relief, a subtle joy, which is such an important factor for insight. Without joy, the mind will not settle. That's why joy is one of the seven factors of awakening. It's fundamental for insight. The temporary liberation of the mind and just becoming aware how much more preferable this state of mind is rather than hunting after pleasant feeling or running away from unpleasant feeling. That's the third foundation of mindfulness, spacious, open mind, citta and pari. And becoming aware of the spaciousness of the mind. And by listening to the space. The silence. which doesn't end at the walls of the room you're sitting in, it just goes on infinite. Just connecting with that immeasurable space. using that as an object for opening the mind even further.
And whenever the mind, you know, wanders off in thinking about something, if it's a short distraction, just gently bring the mind back to listening to the space. And if it's a longer kind of a story, then we just start again with earth element. And grounding. And then, you know, connecting with the subtle joy of the temporary liberated mind and the spaciousness. And then shifting from uh, the spaciousness as an object to just becoming aware of that which knows spaciousness. The knowing itself. And just don't think about what I'm saying, just listen and allow the mind to respond. Becoming aware of the knowing. That which knows infinite space is also infinite itself. Awareness, becoming aware of awareness. So resting into the knowing. It's just a very subtle shift. which, you know, we have to train ourselves in to do it many times, and it, we become familiar with it. And not to overthinking it. But just being aware of the knowing.
and dropping the sense of I behind the knowing. There's no object and no subject, just knowing. Awareness. It's like the cloudless sky. And if a thought, a little thought arises, like a little cloud coming through, just let it move through. No need to do anything about it. It doesn't leave any traces in the sky. So the temporary liberated mind. With the, you know, the three poisons as they are called, greed, hatred and delusion, are just dormant for the time being. Because we have put causes and condition in place. So they are pacified for now. And we can get a taste of the temporary liberated mind and familiarizing ourselves with that so we can <clears throat> get a sense of uh, inspiration and uh, rest and insight into how the mind works. You know, even the most sublime state is impermanent. As long you know, as we haven't fully penetrated ignorance, even the most sublime state of samadhi is impermanent. Just for the remainder of the meditation, we can just uh, now pick up the breath again as a display of impermanence. Being aware of the breathing is being aware of impermanence. And, you know, paying attention to impermanence with a still mind is powerful. It instructs us, you know, about the way things truly are. 
but just being it consciously, being in permanence consciously by being aware of the breathing. The, the flux and the flow you know, of the body, the breath, even the planet. There's nothing is exempt from that truth. And allowing that uh, clear seeing wash away the craving, wash away the attachments because it doesn't make any sense to attach to that which is impermanent. That's called this passion or viraga in the Pali language and raga comes from the Pali word rang which means to color so that passion you know tends to color the way we perceive things and through really deeply allowing impermanence to instruct us this you know this coloring starts to fade away like if you wash a cloth with a big stain it's not going to be clean just after one wash. Many, many times we have to wash it and rub it and slowly, slowly it's going to fade away. The same with our ignorance. Well, like I said, the same with ignorance. It's not our ignorance, it's just ignorance. So allowing that process to just take place according to nature. So viraga is a dispassion and then if we continue with the process then niroda is the next level which is a cessation, you know, being able to see the ending of things because the untrained mind isn't very interested in endings, only if there's some pleasant feeling connected with it. So being able to know the see the ending of mind states, experiences, even our own ending. So seeing that the whole spectrum in, in order to bring some balance into our ways of thinking about experience. And then you know, the, the cutting edge of impermanence is really to bring up the thought, you know, this could be my last breath. You know, bringing that thought up with the in-breath and then relaxing into the spaciousness with the out-breath. the end of our body and our life of this body, you know, the end of paradigms and ways of doing things. You know, all what has hit us right now in the last few months in an unprecedented way.
we are allowing that to really permeate our being. For the sake of the truth of the way things are. for our own benefit and for the benefit of others. We are letting go of these root poisons, greed, hatred and delusion or ignorance. And not squandering you know, this lifetime. And the preciousness of the human life and the fact you know that we all already have connected with a very expedient teaching with very good practical skillful means with very precious You know, to at least know what's the next right thing to do. Even if we can't see far, but we can know that if we know ourselves. If we have that you know, capacity of mindfulness to recognize how we feel in the body, what kind of a feeling tone is there so that we don't get hijacked by it. So instead of reacting, we learn you know, to have a choice and to respond according to our highest aspirations. And sometimes we can't and that's okay too but at least we know the direction we want to go. And we have an excellent toolkit. And that's as good as it gets really.
So I just like to speak a little bit also, you know, to impermanence and uh, use a few of the poems. Don't know how much, how many I can, you know, bring in. And uh, to start with Uttara Bikuni. And if any one of you has the book, it's on page 83. And, uh, you know, as you all know, this is a, a contemporary adaptation of the poems. It's not a literal translation, but it's more like, a, yeah, um, adaptation, we call it here in America. And this poem is by Uttara, and her name is translated as Crossed Over. And she said, I asked Patachara, and Patachara is one of the foremost Arahant Bhikkhunis, you know, who lived at the time of the Buddha, around the sixth century before Christ. And she says, I asked Patachara, what is the path? Patachara said, just see all thoughts, words and actions arising all by themselves, not from some imaginary point within. I only partly understood, but I took a seat. As the sun was setting, I saw the endless line of one thing leading to another that had brought me to the cushion that night. As the moon was coming up, I saw the arising and passing away of all things in every direction. As dawn was breaking, wisdom rose in the east and set fire to the long dark night. But don't take my word for it. Set fire to the darkness within. I promise it's like nothing you have ever seen before. So that's very powerful uh, way, you know, of transmitting that uh, insight, you know, in this great simplicity of impermanence, which is all permeating all levels of experience and which can be known. And, you know, this is like the very Ajahn Chah, for example, you know, in whose lineage has been training for many years, he says his main, you know, insight in his whole career as a meditator and as a monk was when he went as a young monk, he, before he, you know, has settled and had his own monastery and so on, he was wandering around, you know, in the jungles of Thailand and he went to see Achan Man, who is considered the founder of the Thai forest tradition who lived at the beginning of the last century. And he went to see him and he clarified one thing with Achan Man. He just was with him for three days. And he clarified that one thing and that made all the difference to his, you know, life as a, as a meditator. And what he clarified with him was that there are objects or phenomena of mind which can be known and which are impermanent and there's the knowing. And instead, you know, of kind of attaching ourselves to those impermanent phenomena and objects and experiences inside and outside ourselves, so to say, the practice is all about, you know, becoming stabilized and grounded in the knowing, which is, you know, that well, often used example of the sky, you know, the knowing is like the sky and that which is known is like the clouds moving through the sky. And just whenever, you know, there's a sense of getting lost in any of those clouds, in any of those experiences, to remember the knowing, which is like, you know, you can also compare it like if you uh, if there's a wild storm going on outside, being inside the house and looking out, you know, through the window, you, you see the storm for what it is, but you are not completely rattled by it. And that's that kind of um, 
safety, you know, which this groundedness in the knowing can give us. It gives us a sense of being fully with what is happening, but not being completely identified with it. And then, you know, there's a kind of back and forth, back and forth, we get sucked into it. And then we remember and we step out of it. And the more we have trained ourselves in that capacity, you know, to remember sati, mindfulness, the more capacity, you know, for seeing what's going on is there and the more capacity to penetrate and see ever more clearly what is going on, which means, you know, to really, in the beginning, we see just a little bit of impermanence and then over the years, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 20 lifetimes, or however long it's taking, you know, that capacity to see clearly the beginning, middle and ending of things, we become more and more confident in that, tr in that truth. And then we don't need to be so swayed, you know, by feeling tones, for example, or mind states, but we can remember this also is impermanent, not in the, in the way of, you know, turning away from it, but having a, a sense of perspective, like, a, you know, bird's eyes view, so to say. And in order to lift up, to rise up, you know, we need to let go of luggage. And, you know, that can be done in many different ways. Like, for example, the nuns, you know, have chosen a rather extreme way of doing this with, you know, living according to the Vinaya and, and giving up a lot of things, but that's not necessarily the right path for everybody. So, you know, just simplifying our lives and letting go of those things, you know, which are not really um, holding the promise, you know, which the ignorant mind tends to project on lots of things. And our culture, you know, tries heavily, you know, to have us invested in those things because that's you know what people understand what happiness is all about but through this practice we can see that you know there is certain things we do need because we have a body and uh, you know we have a mind and we have to attend to that but there is also lots of things where we actually do have a choice to uh, conserve energy, you know, to not waste our energy with, you know, being caught up in so many different details and complexities. And I think that's, you know, that's one way how we can uh, leave what we have seen in the meditation, you know, to really allow that understanding, you know, which is called wisdom really, to, uh, you know, to have also enough faith to really put it into practice. So we need both, you know, wisdom and faith in order to kind of progress on the path and to, and we need to, you know, enact what we know to be true. So there's this, you know, the realization of wisdom through seeing impermanence, and then there's the actualization of it by really stepping into life accordingly. And uh, that requires faith, you know, because it's scary. But then, you know, if we have tried it, we will see it's actually not as scary as the thinking mind thinks, because it, it tends to open up new spaces, you know, inside of ourselves. And then there is also a responding from outside ourselves, you know, in terms of our life opening up again and again and again and that's the path really that brings me to another poem of sakura yeah this is on page 58 sakura from a good home And, you know, and, and please don't forget that these poems are uh, uttered by nuns, you know, so we can translate that also for, for lay men and lay women. I once gave 
all of myself to being the perfect wife and mother. Then I heard the teachings of the Buddha. I saw the arising and passing away of what was wife and said goodbye to my husband. I saw the arising and passing away of what was mother and said goodbye to my children. What was left I gave to the path. Oh my sisters, you never had to be perfect. If there is something in these teachings calling out to you, it's because something in you is calling out to these teachings. The path will take you whenever you are ready, just as you are. And I find it really beautiful. If there is something in these teachings calling out to you, it's because something in you is calling out to these teachings. You know, this is this kind of leaping up of the heart, you know, which we, you know, when for the first time we had that understanding that this is a teaching which really can support us. I'm sure you all have had that sense of uh, possibility. And that's so beautiful, I think, because it's so uh, mm -hmm. mysterious. And at the same time, it's, it's really, it's sturdy as well, you know. And it gives us a sense of faith and, and, and a sense of uh, courage, you know, to really live to what we have seen in the meditation. And this collection of poems is really, has lots of poems, I think 73 or so, and they all are about, they are very personal and very um, straightforward, really, and, and simple and really sharing personal experience. And, uh, you know, the Terry Gata, so the collection of these poems is a companion to the Terra Gata, which is the poems from the monks. And they are very, quite different. They are much more kind of, quote, unquote, impersonal and not so alive, you know, because the monks, weren't able, I think, to really uh, speak from the depths of their heart because they, you know, they were monks, basically. And uh, it's very interesting also, you know, that this book, the Terry Qatar, was translated into uh, English. I think 10 different translations are, and it, they really became part of world literature, whereas the Terra Gata has, I think, two translations and isn't spoken about very much because it's quite dry, really. They also had, you know, surely the same insights because they are universal, the insight into impermanence, but the capacity, you know, to speak about it in a connected way, in an alive way. The nuns were really, um, they were just, they had more juice, you know, in a way. To, and this is why, people of this day and age can still, you know, gain a sense of uh, inspiration from them. And that's, you know, why this whole project has started because of that juiciness, you know, which we all need in order to keep, keep going. Yeah. So the arising and passing away, she saw, And you know, in order to be able to see that we don't have to be perfect, we just need to be where we are and and look closely. And that's you know what wisdom is the result of that. You know, looking maybe we can say you know, with with a with a magnifying glass, looking at our experience in the rim of the magnifying glass are the teachings of the Buddha. And then through that, you know, we, we look at our experience and then we start to, through repetition, it just starts to become focused more and more. And, you know, and what's needed for that is, is to have enough initial faith in the teaching so we are willing you know to invest the time and 
maybe unpleasant feelings which are rising and all of that. And then slowly but surely, you know, we start to recognize and, and we start to familiarize ourselves with the teaching. So it starts, you know, with information which we just hear or read somewhere. And then by, you know, applying that in our meditation, it becomes our personal knowledge. And then by then really living accordingly, then it becomes like part of our being. It becomes an intuitive knowing and uh, a non-conceptual knowing. And then, you know, we are that. We are that wisdom. We are that faith. And we live accordingly. And through that, you know, more and more we are being able, you know, to see reality for what it is. And uh, I really like that saying of Bhantpuna Ratana, who is a very well-respected uh, Sri Lankan monk who has been always very supportive of the bhikkhunis. He is now in his 90s. And he always says a beautiful, uh, cool sentence. I really like He says, escaping into reality rather than from it. And that's, you know, what the practice enables us is to really escape into reality by just going deeper and deeper into it. And then, you know, once reality was like kind of threatening, you know, but actually we be make friends with it because we see that's the only way to go. You can't turn away from it because there is no turning away from reality. Neither inside nor outside of the skin, you know, which we call ourselves and outside world. Then there's another one poem by Nandutra Bikuni, and that's translated as greatest joy, her name. And she says, I spent most of my teenage years running from one bed to another. Any sign of warmth would do. Each worked for a while until they got possessive or mean or boring or I did. Then I got new friends, shaved my head and started eating once a day. During the long lonely nights that followed, I would remember all the nice warm baths, all the late nights and long mornings, waking up next to beautiful warm bodies. One night, shivering on the ground, I started to cry. It's not fair, no matter what I do, the other thing always looks better. Listen, my heart, I know how exhausting it all gets. Don't give up until you are ready to give up for real. I love that very much. Don't give up until you are ready to give up for real. And, you know, giving up for real is not like, you know, giving up in the sense of uh, just collapsing. But it's, it's a giving up which comes from inside. It's actually a letting go. And that's, you know, what, if we are after anything, that's what we are after as far as I understand the teaching, you know, of, and all three schools of Buddhism, they are after this, after letting go of ignorance and uh, how that is, you know, managed is through really kind of taking the mind and we are making it look at life as it is, you know, because the mind often would like to spin a story on top of it because of, you know, certain habits which we have developed over lifetimes. And that's, you know, what we need to kind of co concern ourselves with, to undo those habits by having, you know, repeated reality checks. And the meditation is the technology for those reality checks. It's, it's a very well you know, um, proved tool that it, it has worked for many before us. And 
it has the same capacity now as it had you know at the time of the buddha and we do have you know a real good toolkit which we got from the from the you know all of those who have gone before us and it's been handed down over the centuries and you know we can use it we can update it in some manner you know by using maybe different words for the tools but the tools are the same because we are homo sapiens and we are just operating in a, in a certain way and anyone you know who applies those tools will have the results depending on you know how diligently we work with it and also on our karmic dispositions but at least you know we can go in the right direction there's no it's not rocket science really <laughs> <laughs>